the menstruating athlete has an increased probability of having ligament injuries. Welcome to the Hollywood Dance Experience Podcast, bringing you informational insight as well as valuable knowledge how to assist your dancers in our industry. I'm your host, Jocelyn Basham, joined by my co host, Kristen Nurka and Julie Froman. Our next guest, thank you. Hello. Our next guest, I don't know if you were here last year but last summer we had the opportunity to have dr jerry here with us and we're lucky enough to have him here for the second summer in a row we're really excited how are you feeling i'm doing very well thank you Your mic. <laughs> i'm not an artist <laughs> yeah there you go well thank you for the question yes i'm doing very well today thanks you're so welcome um dr jerry has a presentation ready for you guys are you guys ready yes, yes. Yeah. all right without further ado take it away okay well, I like to move around, so I'm gonna jump down here, I'm gonna be walking back and forth. Is that okay with everybody and the cameras in the back? Okay, so, oh, old man step. Okay, so, the way I see human beings and patients is in a triad, sort of in this triangle right here. One third of us is mechanical, one third of us is chemical, and one third of us is emotional. And they're all interlinked. If I pull any one or take an injury, injury to any one of these thirds, by definition, it's gonna pull at least one of the other thirds out. So we cannot segment too hard. It's only mechanical, or only chemical, or only emotional. So what I'm gonna to try to do today is explain that relationship. Feedback. No, just keep it, keep it, yeah. Probably Jimi Hendrix there. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's how what I want to do today. How I got involved with the dance industry is I went to, I was invited to go to my first dance convention. Just hold it closer to your mouth. To my, yeah, okay, you thank you. To my first it's dance convention. And I came out of the sports world and I was looking at these athletes and I was so impressed with their dedication and their, and their athleticism. And I started to ask the question to them, how many of you see yourselves as athletes. Maybe 10% of the hands went up. How many of you see yourselves as athletes? Not many. Artists, absolutely. Athletics, not so much. So that got me curious because that dancer is an athlete. Yeah. I'm not a dancer, but I, can, I understand kinematics, I understand motion, and they're absolute athletes and I'm impressed, and I'm gonna bring that to you, some of this awareness. So, volleyball dancer and a baseball player. All are athletes, they require unique training. You can't go to the gym and do the same thing for a pitcher, for someone who's doing hip hop, and someone who's doing volleyball, or a skier, they're all different, and why is that? So, from this point, we gotta get a little technical, it's okay, We'll explain this. We're going to go over mechanical. Mechanical, chemical, emotional. We're going to go over muscle fiber types. There's only two I want you to think of. Type 1 and type 2. Think of that. Type 1 fibers here are slow twitch fibers. Think of a marathoner. So if you're a, a cyclist, a swimmer, a distance athlete, you have type one fibers. Important to keep that in your mind. Contr compare that to, contrast that to the fast twitch fibers, which are called type two. They are the sprinters, the weightlifters. They produce a lot of force, but they fatigue really easily. And if we were to look at the cross section of the population, we go out on the boulevard, we take 100 people, we do biopsies of their muscle, they're about 50-50. 50 type one, 50 type two. But what does the literature say about dancers? Well, in physiological Scandinavia, they had a high proportion of type one fibers in the thigh muscles of young dancers. That lends itself, so we need to start thinking, how do we train that dancer now? Because they're type one fibers. And in conclusion, the muscle fiber type composition 
in young dancers of both sexes differs from that of the average individual of the same age. And this is between 10 years old and 20 year olds. This is this age group. So you're dealing with most likely a type one fiber type. So what do we know? Athletes have a greater type one muscle fiber, low endurance, I mean high endurance, and low force. Think of it this way. How many marathons did you run? One. Did you sprint it? No, you ran slow. So type one is low force, high endurance. Most styles of dance are type one training. Therefore, type two muscle fibers gets less attention. Is that, are we building a well-rounded athlete to go out and perform these incredible moves, which to me is getting more and more athletic. You spend half your time upside down, slamming on the floor, lifting, jumping out of the sky. It's incredible. So the question then becomes, how do we train for stamina and power for the dance athlete, knowing that they're type one? We can't just go to the gym, walk up to some machine, and then just start doing something. What are we doing? I have no idea. So we need to be focused on your athlete. So we want to focus on weight training for type two muscles. We already said that most dance is type one, but type two is your high power that stabilizes joints. So some training would be explosive movements like plyometric training, jump training, box jumps, quick feet step ups, explosive push ups. Now I'm gonna be nice because I would have asked Nurka to lie down here and do a push up, clap her hands and come back down. That's type one or type two? Type two, that's a type two fiber. Super important. <laughs> Next year, <laughs> okay. So that's one strategy to hit your type twos. So if your athlete is needing more power, you might want to start thinking about your plyometrics, your box jumps, and it is hard. It's difficult. Another way is to do heavier weight training. Repetition ranges between six and 12 for about three to four sets. So a lot, I see a lot of athletes, a lot of dancers get into the gym and they pick up the bar and they're doing this. They're looking around, they're doing this. I'm not sure what you're doing. I'm not sure what you're doing. If I want to get you stronger, I'm going to load up your squat. And I'm going to hit the 6 to 12 range so that when you're in 10, 11, and 12, those repetitions are tough, tough, tough. It's got to be hard. And when you train like that, that's when it's like, oh my gosh, this is really hard, but you're training your type twos because dancers already have a high population of type ones and you train them during dance class. So we're building for power and we're building for speed. Stronger type two protects joints from injury. That kind of makes sense, right? That's nice. But what about other joint structures like ligaments and tendons? So. The muscle contracts, producing a certain amount of force. Now we know that we want to do plyometrics, jump training, high explosive work, heavier set weight training, or we can weight train with lighter weight, but high repetition and low rest. So if you're in the 15 to 20, 25 rep range on a lighter weight, those last six are tough, tough, tough. It's not easy. People quit way too early because it hurts. I know. But your athlete is going into high-end athletics, class after class after class. We want to reduce injury and make the joints more bulletproof. So that's what muscles are. But what about ligaments and tendons? Ligaments are collagen structures which hold bone to bone. And they restrict range of motion. Tendons are the structure on the either end of the muscle which inserts into the bone so that it moves. So my bicep muscle here 
my tendon will be here and up here. So when this contracts, it moves the elbow. Muscles, tendons, ligaments. Well, what's the big deal about this? Well, how about we start with hormonal influences on ligamentous strength? This is the Frontiers of Physiology, 2018. The effects of estrogen on musculoskeletal performance and, and, uh, and injury risk. In the abstract, high estrogen levels can decrease power and performance and make women more prone to catastrophic ligament injury. Okay, that's crazy. And the literature tends to bear this out. So we want to work on our type twos to stabilize those joints because the menstruating athlete has an increased probability of having ligament injuries. And here's what a graph would look like. ACL injury during your cycle. As estrogen's going up and it drops a blue line, the red is progesterone. At around day nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, these X's represent the ACL ruptures. There is a three to six fold increase in ACL ruptures when you're coming into your mid cycle for the menstruating athlete. So what does this mean to me? I'm gonna tell that athlete, your technique has to be on point. You cannot get sloppy. If you start to get tired, don't push it. Because I know there's things with dancers, it's about full out. I love the term. <laughs> okay. There was uh, a, a young female athlete. This explosive movement dropped down. Her rear end dropped down. Her knees were pointed out, and the ACL popped. She's done it a thousand times. Now, I'm not going to run up and say, hey, where are you in your cycle? That would be slightly inappropriate. <laughs> but as a parent or a coach, you might want to let them know, right? You might want to let them know. Now, there is information, because I was asked this before, contraceptive devices, contraception, estrogen and progesterone pills. There's controversial data on that. Now, I'm not going to tell you what you should or shouldn't do. That's a very personal decision, OK? But the information is out there, and you should talk to your doctors about this. If you know you're going into a style of dance, which is very hard, very aggressive, because tearing these ligaments in the knee isn't fun. And how does this happen? When we land and twist. How many times do you see that in the dance? That's all what you guys do. And you do it coming from upside down, and you land and twist. And you gotta look nice. Yeah, and you gotta project. So I think this is really interesting to let our menstruating athletes know this. Our choreographers and the parents to protect them. Hyperflexibility syndrome. This is incredible. This is my thing. I've seen athletes come up to me and they go, Dr. Jerry, I am so tight. Oh my gosh, I said, oh really, I'm so sorry. Bend over and touch your toes. She's chewing on her kneecaps. <laughs> Bend backwards. They do this. There's no way I could go to court and argue that this individual is tight. <laughs> they should pull my license. Because there is no good metric to measure what is normal physiology, ranges of motion. Because the dance athlete Part of that performance is maintaining those lines, is to maintain this aesthetic. But it comes at a cost. And that cost, I'm backing up saying, well, what about your type two muscle fibers? Are you training hard, training heavier? You're not gonna get bulky. You're doing too much type ones. But you gotta get stronger. So this hyperflexibility syndrome has other consequences. Research shows about 44% of dance students are hyperflexible. That's a lot. I can go to that room over there and I can say bend over and these people are just super bendy. 
Now, that's a genetic condition which causes laxity in the ligaments, which is increased joint range of motion. So you're losing stability, which decreases, which is a decrease in collagen production. Super important, collagen production. So how much protein do you eat and how much collagen do you take? If you can't naturally make it, you want to feed yourself as much of the building blocks to increase that strength and stability because we know what our athletes are going to go do. They're going to go train and flip upside down. Research also shows in the flexibility individual, there's a high correlation with anxiety disorder, depression, and gastrointestinal disorders like irritable bowel syndrome. It's one and the same. So we have to be aware that look at that athlete, look at their mental health, look at their gastrointestinal health, their diet plays a huge importance. If they're anxious, people with hyperflexibility syndrome has shown that on, on brain MRIs, an area of the brain called the amygdala is way larger than the average person, which encodes for anxiety. So they're kind of pre-set up. Yes, they can hold these beautiful lines, but they can actually have anxiety. So you need to be aware. So maybe sports psychology, having an open line of communication with the athlete, telling the, the coach, the choreographer, the studio owner, to sometimes there's a difference between a pat on the back and a kick in the butt. Not everyone needs a kick in the butt. So muscle tendon ligament training and nutrition is extremely important to the dance athlete. Well, we kind of reviewed that. Your type two fibers, maybe hypoflexibility syndromes. So the ligaments aren't as strong, the tendons aren't as strong. And with the menstruating athlete, there's an increased risk of catastrophic injury to those ligaments. Well, how do we, what do we do about that? This is a side shot here, if you can see this. This is an MRI on the side of the knee. And this article says, the effects of season, of season long participation on ACL um, size in the female intercollegiate soccer athlete. So preseason, this dark line, which is outlined in red, is about a normal size ACL. Postseason, it's about 20% larger. The ligament got stronger. And I know for sure, collegiate athletes, females, are in that gym killing it. They are working out. Our dance athletes need to get in that gym. They need stronger, thicker ligaments to protect. Because you don't want to see me when there's an injury. This is not, I, you know, I want to be able to watch your athlete. I don't want you to come in and go, I'm here. I'm going to say, what have you been doing? Did you take my class? No. Well, you should have. So there's a Mayo Clinic study which basically says, well, some of you might ask, well, what are the type of exercises might we want to do to increase strength in the ligaments and tendons? We've already talked about muscle, those type two, jump training, plyometrics, heavier weight training, lower repetition, hurts, hurts, hurts. Well, this was out of the Mayo Clinic and this is the effects of isometric, eccentric, or heavy, slow resistant exercises for patellar tendinopathy. So you've got tendonitis in the, in the knee. So isometric, iso means one, metric means length. So if I take a weight and I hold it in my bicep like this and I'm holding it, okay, isometric. That exercises changes the way your body produces protein, not in the muscle, but it shifts it to the tendon and the ligament. Super important. And they compare that to eccentric, where you'll take a weight and you're gonna drop the weight down. I'm making the, length, the, the muscle get longer while I'm holding a weight to that heavy, slow resistance exercises. Well, what did they find? they found that the conclusion of that study said isometric exercises can be trusted as to a guide clinical practice grade A, highest level. Isometric exercises appear to be more effective during competitive seasons for short-term pain relief. So if you're in season, you're doing competition, you're trying to get number one, you're trying to get the solo, you're trying to get all these things, and you are in 
the studio. Am I going to put you through jump training? Probably not. But am I going to give you isometric exercises to strengthen the ligaments and the tendons? Yes, because it's low risk, high reward, because you're already jumping around. And the clinical evidence actually tells us it's guiding us. It's screaming at us to say, let's be a little bit more specific with their dance athletes because they're doing that with baseball, with football, soccer, but somehow the dance community has gotten shoved over into the space called the art. And I agree with it. It's very artistic and beautiful, but let's make no mistake, they are no less of an athlete than somebody playing baseball, football, hockey, soccer. They're the same. So, tendons and ligaments. Isometric exercises are best used in season. Examples of isometric exercises, wall squats. The simple, good old fashioned wall squat. And you can make that more difficult. You can squat down, raise one leg straight out. You can raise one leg straight out and grab a weight and put it out towards your side and hold that for 45 seconds and tell me how you feel. Yes. So I just want you to move. Get on that wall and move. And if there was a stable wall here, Nurka would absolutely be doing this right now. <laughs> <laughs> not the push-up? Push yeah. Next year, I'll remember. Uh, <laughs> upper body strength, not there. Type one or type two? She needs type twos. She's dominant type one. <laughs> so chemical, and we're really more the nutritional component, remember? Chemical, mechanical, emotional. Now we're moving into this chemical. Nutrition, the body's fuel, protein, carbs, fans, fats. Dancers need to eat, okay? I, I mean, I can't keep my boys who are athletes from eating. You guys are, it's a, it's a different deal, okay? You're doing all this exercise, you're gonna get a salad and a frappuccino. <laughs> and you wonder why they're like, bruh, leave me alone. Uh, I don't wanna do it. Oh, I'm so glad it's you guys because I've already beaten mine. So this is important based on what we've just learned about muscles, tendons, and ligaments. It's a decrease in collagen production, so we need a little bit more protein than we think. I personally like 25% of your daily calories coming from protein. Just increase your protein. And if that person, if you're a vegetarian, then you can get pea protein. Doesn't really matter. Just take more protein to give your body the building blocks, because if you are exercising, you're turning on chemical pathways to build muscle and or collagen. And that's super important. And then the rest, you know, about 50% from carbohydrates and about 25% from fat. That's not a bad thing. I love fat, right? If somebody, if your athlete is going to go into a situation, every gram of fat gives you nine calories. Let's say they're there for three hours. It's okay to have peanut butter. It's okay to have fat because for every gram you get nine calories. Carbohydrates and protein gives you four. You're going to get hungrier quicker. So if they can't get to the food, load them up with some avocados. Good fats. And dancers have a unique demand, aesthetics. And this goes back to that, th that concept of they're not athletes. Okay, because the definition is a set of principles concerned with the nature and appreciation of beauty, especially in art. Probably heightened also by social media. Pictures of other dancers, what do I want to look like? Can I perform this way? If, if a baseball athlete gains or loses 10 pounds, nobody cares. Can you perform? They have eye black, they're screaming, they're sweaty, nobody cares. The dance athlete is concerned about how they look and they're judged on how they look. And so you cannot look like somebody else. You are beautiful how you are. Be the best version of yourself. Don't decrease these calories. Be the best version of yourself. Now, 
I've worked with some athletes that they wanted to lose weight. And it's just a difficult time for them. So I look at them and say, well, very powerful lower body, upper body not so much. So I can change the aesthetic by training them with heavier weight, the type two, get them a little bit bigger in the shoulders and the upper back. When you see them, the waist and the thighs look smaller. It's all angles. It's not trying to reduce what God gave you. If that's your thighs, that's your thighs. Do something else to then make it look like you're still in shape and powerful. That's the point. Be yourself. Do not try to be anybody else because you're only going to see me when you're hurt. And we're trying to prevent this. Quick breakdown. Calorie breakdown of dance class. This is what you got to eat. It's plain and simple. Contemporary dance class averages 528 calories. Ballet dance, 462. Tap class, 350 calories. Hip hop class, 480. Okay, that's a lot. And you go to convention and you go from class to class to class. And I see the frappuccino and the salad and I want to just shake my head. What are you doing? What are you doing? It's okay to have avocado toast. In fact, it's encouraged. Eat. You're going to burn it up. This is just for the class. That isn't your basal metabolic rate, just to live. And I know the athlete is 5'2 and 110 pounds. Oh my gosh, they're killing it. That's why your athlete is fit. But if you are trying to fit an aesthetic and you're not eating the proper nutrients and you happen to be hyperflexible and you're entering your mid cycle, wow, that's a recipe for disaster. Something can go wrong and you can pull, strain, and tear things. Okay. Chemical, mechanical, emotional. And I'm going to call this focus. Now, I put this in here not so much for the athlete, but for us. Us. This is really, really important. The emotional component. There could be a whole 10 hour lecture on this. So, I'm going to talk about the vanishing gorilla experiment. Some of you are familiar with this, some of you may not be. This was done back in 1999. And let me set this up. There's two groups. There's three individuals in white t-shirts, three individuals in black t-shirts. Each group has a basketball. The direction is to the audience, and you're incentivized, you have to count how many times the team in white passes the basketball amongst each other, not the team in black, and they're moving around. And so they're mixing it up, and they're passing this basketball. Well, what were the results? And people will scream out, 17, 9, 21. It was 15. It's called intentional blindness. When we hyper-focus on a task, people fail to see unintentional objects in plain sight. Approximately 50% of the participants miss the gorilla in the middle. So what happens is, is as they're passing this around and you're hyper-focused on this, this person comes out, full gorilla suit, slowly, mind you, <laughs> walks out, beats their chest, and walks off stage. <laughs> and 50% missed it. Because we get hyper-focused. So your athlete may be hyper-focused, but we've got to be careful not to participate in that. Because we have to be the athlete's eyes, ears, and wisdom. That's our job is to raise them and protect them. Because if we participate and we're doing costumes and traveling the country and doing all the stuff, other things can fall away by the wayside. So activities, outside dance is crucial for well-roundedness. Social activities, schoolwork, cross-training, hobbies, family activities and personal growth. You've got to cross-train your athlete. It cannot be only about dance. They can't. Because if it's just about dance, they're going to cone in, cone in, and cone in. And then you ask them a question, they won't even know how they're feeling. 
give them other activities. So this is for the lay, you know, individuals. We can just recreate this experiment. But what about experts? Do these results hold up? This is a CT scan. So you guys have had MRIs and CT scans. It's pretty cool, right? It's kind of fun. So this is a CT scan of a cross section of a lung field. And the task is given how many of these white dots represent something really nasty in the lungs. And they looked and they took radiologists from Harvard. And they said, you need to find out what's going on. So what do you see? And it's all these slices. Do you see the gorilla in the upper right corner? So when we bring your attention to it, what did those people do? The gorilla is 48 times larger than the average white dot, the pathology. Out of 24 radiologists examined, 83% missed the gorilla. So even as experts, parents were an expert on our children, choreographers, studio owners, we're experts that we're running a business. You're an expert at your relationship. If we focus too hard on one thing, we can miss really important things. It's unintentional. Now this isn't to say radiologists are bad. They're beautiful. It's that they save lives. But it's interesting to, to note that we ourselves need to do it for ourselves and do it for our athletes because they are hyper-focused. So there's this tension between making it to the top, you have to be focused, but not falling off track and missing something. And so we cannot, in my opinion, follow in their footsteps to be as hyper-focused on the result as they are. We need to be wise. Class dismissed. Thank you.